This week, the truth about the martial arts business is that the vast majority of self-defense and martial arts instructors are not teaching what could very well be the single most important self-defense skill of all. This skill will not only reduce the chance of an attack, but will have a major impact on all areas of their interactions with others. This important skill is the ability to deal with verbal attacks. Our guest today is a 10th degree black belt in Tung Fu. Well, not really, but Sam Horn created Tung Fu to teach people how to turn hostility into harmony and help them avoid a mental breakdown in the face of aggression. I first read this book, Tung Fu, about 15 years ago, and it had a massive impact on my understanding of the power of words. With straightforward strategies and proven techniques, Tung Fu examines almost every kind of verbal conflict, from fights with your spouse or a stalemate with the kids. It also shows you how to use martial arts for the mind and the mouth to deflect attacks, disarm disputes, and defuse any explosive situation. Quick reminder to leave a comment, subscribe to the show, rate and review this. Please help us grow the truth about the martial arts business. You can also use the microphone at Mata Podcast to record a message that goes straight to me. Here's my interview with author, speaker, and communications expert, Sam Horn, right after this word from our sponsor, Empower Boxing. Have you noticed that despite all the media coverage of MMA, that it's getting harder to attract adults into your school? The truth is that adults know what martial arts offers, and they are just not interested in uniforms, belts, bowing, and all the complexity of learning a style. So what do adults want? It's simple. Adults want results. Adults want to get in shape fast. They want to learn real boxing, kickboxing, and martial arts without all of the baggage. That's why John Graydon created Empower Kickboxing. Empower Kickboxing is a complete boxing, kickboxing, and martial arts curriculum, marketing, and business in a box. Empower Kickboxing targets adults, but it's great for kids, too. We help generate Empower Boxing members for your school. Getting adults is easy with Empower Kickboxing. Go to EmpowerKickboxing.com right now. You know, I agree, and, and we'll have this a conversation, so it's interactive, we hold people's attention, focus on what might be useful for them. Well, I'm excited to be here. As I said before, I've followed your work from the very beginning. I think Tung Fu was the first book, but Pop was short after that, and Pop was really interesting way to dig into your business and find ways to make it pop on a daily basis. So just, just great. I didn't know, however, that you did a book on bullying. The bullet taken by the horn. So we we, we can chat a little bit about each one of those. The focus today is on Tung Fu. And in the martial arts, (laughs) I believe I've learned that there's a technique for everything. And that is exactly what Tung Fu is. Techniques on how to resolve conflict verbally. And as martial arts instructors, holy cow, that's ideal for our audiences. So let's just kind of come back to the idea of where, where... Did Tung Fu come from? (laughs) I love it. And all of your martial arts instructors are going to love this backstory, John. It was uh, almost 30 years ago that Dr. Ray Oshiro out of the University of Hawaii asked me to do a course on, on dealing with difficult people. So this was a public workshop. We had people from government there and the military, people from um, oh, banking and from uh, tech and from healthcare. And at our first break, there was a gentleman, he didn't even get up from his chair. He just kind of sat there gazing off into his face. And I'm curious. So I went over and I said, what are you thinking about? And he said, Sam, I'm a real estate broker. He said, I deal with some very demanding and arrogant people. And they seem to think they can treat me any way they want to. He said, I'm tired of it. He said, I thought you were going to teach us some zingers to fire back at people and put them in their place. He said, that's not what this is about. And I assured him that this is not about putting people in their place. It's about putting ourselves in their place so we can respond with compassion instead of contempt. And then here's where it relates to your audience. He said, I'm a student of martial arts. He said, I studied karate, taekwondo, judo. He said, what you're talking about is like a verbal form of kung fu, isn't it? Eureka! (laughs) (laughs) Because martial arts is the physical art and skill 
And Tung Fu is the verbal art I, and skill. I think he was looking more for how a comedian would, ha- would handle a, a heckler, heckler on the stage. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's a zinger. So after reading the book and now reviewing the book, I really, and, and in fact, buying your course off of Amazon, and Liz, we've been driving around my car for the last two weeks, <laughs> last week or so. I think this should be required training for martial arts instructors. I created the first professional association for the martial arts industry and also the first nationally recognized and respected instructor certification course. Even Chuck Norris came to one of the classes and, and hung out and I had a lot of them. The biggest names in the arts uh, come to this event in Texas over and over. We certified over 6,000. And communication is a big part of it. I'm, I'm, it's something that I pay a lot of attention to. However, the missing component that I think about it now is Tung Fu. It was more about getting the best response from your students when you're speaking. For instance, do you say the student's name first and then the question in the class? Or do you state the question and then the student name? Well, the idea is that you, if you say the name first, the rest of the students relax <laughs> because they're not getting called on. But if you make the question out to everybody in the room and then you say, Sally, before you say Sally, they're all thinking, okay, what's the heck is that? <laughs> so we know where Tung Fu came from now, and it's a great story. You were there doing a seminar on verbal communication and it turned into Tung Fu. What, what is the difference? Or did you just take what you already had and organize it into a book? You know, I'm so glad you asked that, John, because here's the thing. We're taught math and science and history in school, right? We're not taught how to get along with people. You know, let's let's make this really relevant to everyone who's watching and listening to this. We're not taught what to do when we have to cancel a tournament that our athletes have been training for for months. What? We're not taught what to do when someone is prepaid for like six weeks of classes and we can no longer hold it in a live studio, right? We're not taught what to do when we have to tell our athletes they have to wear masks and they can't breathe in their mask. And so even if we're really good at what we do, we are not taught about what to do when people are complaining, accusing us of something that's not true. Uh, You know, they're coming to us uh, very upset. That's what Tung Fu is, is all of those communication skills we wish we'd been taught back in school. Your book is in four sections, and I don't recall the sections, but let's go through each one if that works for you as a structure. And if do you recall, the, I'm sure you recall it better than I do. I do. In <laughs> fact, um, you know, John, you may know that I was the MC and the executive director of the Maui Writers Conference for 17 years. However, the only thing they agreed on in 17 years, ink it when you think it. So I'm going to ask everyone watching to please get a quick a piece of paper and a pen because I'm going to give you something you can post right by your laptop, post right on your refrigerator at home, post right in your school, because not only can we change these words to lose into words to use, we can help all of our students and our parents and our instructors do it as well. Sound good? Sounds great. Okay, so put a vertical line down the center of your piece of paper and at the top left, put words to lose. And then on the top right, put words to use. And we're going to show how to shift conflict into cooperation and connection. Okay. Now, how about I tell a 60-second story. Listen for the word that's doing all the damage, right? It's uh, say that a parent calls you really upset because they have a child that's been training for one of these tournaments for six months and was really good, was hoping to meddle, da 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 and you say, well, I, you know, I know you're disappointed, but it's like, well, I was looking forward to it also, but it's like, well, there's nothing I can do about it, but it's not my decision. Do you hear how the word but actually creates conflict? Okay, let's put that word but over on the left and over on the right, put another little three letter word and I hear what you're saying and here's what we're going to do about it. I understand you're disappointed and here... Do you hear how the word and advances the conversation and the word but anchors it in an argument? It's a more positive bridge. And I would say also that, and I'd like your comment on this, a pause, not maybe not even and, just I know you wanted to go, but the situation is this. That would work probably as well. Thank you. Uh, because, and, <laughs> and yay for the pause. And John, even someone said, well, how about however? And I said, however is a fancy but. It is a fancy <laughs> but. <laughs> because if you say, I know you paid for this six weeks, however, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, right? Yeah. 
So a pause, and I was on a virtual meeting uh, about a week ago, and the host used the word but six times in the first minute. Well, wow. I know it's nine o'clock and we're supposed to start, but yeah. I know we were supposed to meet in Las Vegas, but it's like, I know you want to ask questions, but you need to put your, and even though this was virtual, I could feel people around the country almost like recoiling because that word but is so argumentative. It is so negative. He could have completely changed the tone of that meeting by using and welcome. We're looking forward to it. And we're going to start and we're real big difference. As you're explaining that story, and it's a great one. It came to mind that the martial arts principle of align and redirect is central to what you're doing with Tung Fu, whether you knew it or not, that was it. But is no alignment. That is not an alignment. So in a sense, I think about two people pushing a rock. They're both on both sides pushing against each other when they're button. And then once you eliminate the butt, go to and or a pause, they move over to the same side of the rock. And we're taking care of this together. Align and Align redirect. Align and redirect. Oh, I'm I'm so with you, John. <laughs> okay, shall we talk about another word to lose and use that aligns and All redirect? All right, here we go. Okay, we've got a lot of athletes on the call. And so uh, I had the privilege of working with Rod Labor on uh, in the tennis industry down on Hilton Head Island. So we had our national tennis camp. I've been putting in a lot of hours. And so he asked if I wanted to rally one afternoon, kind of as a, as a reward for my hard work. Well, he's making me work for it, John. He's pulling me right. He's pulling me left. He's running me back, bringing me up short. Finally, he throws up a pretty weak lob. If I come up and put this overhead away, I'm going to take a point. I'm going to take a game off rocket. So I come and in my eagerness, I commit the cardinal sin of overheads. Do you know what that is, by the way? I do not. I pulled my head down. See, I, I didn't keep my eyes on the ball. I, I will look where I was going to put the ball. Well, I didn't miss hit the ball. I missed the ball. <laughs> <laughs> and I erupted. You know, I should have known better. It's like how many times. And now Rocket was known for his sportsmanship. And he just kind of waits for me to. T- and then he beckons me over and he said, Sam, champions never use the word should. Oh, they always focus on next time. So let's put should over there on the left. Oh, great. You know, should have been more careful. You should have listened. You know, you, sh- you should have anticipated that. You should have, you know, the word should usually pertains to the past. Do we know anyone who can undo the past? Instead, it's from now on. Next time. Now we're teaching them how to do it right instead of catching them doing it wrong. We are shaping their performance instead of shaming it. And they're learning from mistakes instead of losing faith. And we're taking their focus from the past to the future. That's huge. And furthermore, I know every single one of your martial arts, it's all about helping them get better, right? Mm -hmm. And we don't help people get better by making them feel bad and telling them what they should have done. They feel helpless and they resent us, even if what we're saying is right, because they can't undo it. So focusing on next time in the future, now on, once again, we're a coach instead of a critic. And I know everyone in your community is a coach and not a critic. One of the developments over the past, I would say, 15 years in every classroom Mm -hmm. is overpraising. If a child is awesome the first time they try a technique, why are they going, you know, that was awesome. Good job. I've seen kids try and break boards and they miss the boards Never broke them after five tries. Instructor gave him a high five and a good job. (laughs) That's not helpful because when they do get praised, they get it all the time. It just doesn't have any meaning. So Mm -hmm. expand upon that a little bit because we're in it. We're we're in. This comes out of the whole self-esteem thing of Dr. Nathaniel Brandon, who Mm -hmm. was a mentor to my instructor, Joe Lewis. Mm -hmm. And he really mm-hmm. messed his head up. <laughs> so mm-hmm. talk about a little bit about, not to take you off course, because we'll I want to get back to your situations, but overpraising, See, uh, everything's awesome. John, I love what you're saying, because what is Tung Fu based on? That words matter. That what we say makes a huge difference in how the person responds and reacts to us, right? Right. And so you, once again, let's keep going back, because martial arts is a sport. It's, it's, it's an art. It's mm-hmm. a skill. Is when we use words like uh, we tell our kids don't run around the pool, what are they going to do? If I say I'm not going to get mad, what am I going to do? 
If I tell someone to stop interrupting me in sports and tennis, if I say, don't pull your head down, what are we going to do? So I believe in words that focus on the desired behavior instead of the dreaded behavior. Because now we are teaching once again. We are helping them get better by showing them how to do it right. So instead of this false praise for just for effort, great job. And internally they know they didn't do a good job. That sets up dissonance and it destroys trust. So that is why we can praise effort and give them something specific to be more effective, to do it even better in the future. That's where their esteem is protected, and yet they are learning skills that they are advancing and developing. Great advice. Love it. Okay, back to your scenarios. Okay, so let's go into uh, a third uh, word to lose. Sound good? Mm Mm-hmm. Right now, we have to give a lot of bad news, right? We're telling people uh, we're, we're telling people that we can't do what they want. And it's so easy to say, well, it's not my fault. There's nothing I can do. There's no way I can change it. And guess what? When we use those words, there's nothing or no, we can't because or there's no way they conclude we don't care. And that's when they get louder and angrier in an effort to make us care. Over on the right, let's put the words yes, as soon as, instead of no, you can't because, yes, you can, as soon as, or instead of no, I can't because, yes, I can right after, or instead of there's nothing, it's there's something. Now, let me give you a couple examples, okay? Yep. I bet, um, are you, uh, I know you're a parent because you were talking about your son the other day, right? So All right. I can't resist. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there was a woman in one of my Kung Fu workshops, and she said, Sam, this is going to change the way I parent. She said, I'm a single mom. I've got three kids under the age of 10, and it seems like all I ever do is tell them no. Can I play with my friends? No, you can't because you haven't done your homework. Can I watch TV? No, you can't because you haven't done your chores. And then we normally stack, and we use all these phrases from the left-hand column. You know the rules around here. That TV doesn't go out until those chores are done. How many times do I have to tell you? When are you going to off we go, right? Yep. <laughs> and that, it, you talked about a bridge. No, that builds a gap, right? She said, Sam, I've been thinking about this. Yes, you can play with your friends as soon as you finish your homework. Do your math. Let me have a look at it. Then you can go out and shoot hoops. Yes, you can watch TV right after you finish your chores. You know, it's like take out the trash, clean up your room, and then you can, do you see? She said, Sam, this is not semantics. This changes the whole relationship (laughs) because they used to see me as the meanie blocking them from what Mm -hmm. it is they want. Now, who's responsible for getting what it is they want? They are. Yeah, It's like there's a big door and you're handing them the key. You know, it's yes. just like, okay, as soon as you finish, here's the key. Go have fun. That's exactly right. That's Again, right. The, the, it goes to future focused. All this is very, very much future, future focused, which I like. I love it. So it's, I mean, I'm excited. And it's pragmatic. And how about another example? Because we certify people in Tung Fu. And uh-huh. one of our individuals, her, her brother was her best friend. And he had not been taking care of his health. And he, he had some issues. He kept putting it off. Finally, he went in for a couple of days of test, and then the doctor called and said, please come in tomorrow and bring a family member with you. And he knew it wasn't good news. Mm -hmm. And she went with him. The doctor had his head down. All the the charts were in front of him. He did not even look up, John. He just said, it's stage four cancer. We caught it too late. There's nothing we can do. Oh, my goodness. And Gwen said she wanted to reach across the desk and say, couldn't you at least say, I wish there were more we could do? Couldn't you at least say there's something I can suggest? This is a support group of people who are dealing with this diagnosis, and they find it very helpful to be able to connect. Do you see, right now, a lot of us are in a position, once again, where there, if we say there's nothing I can do, we're like slamming the door on people when we say, I wish there were something more I can do. Here's something that we can do. Here's something we can keep in mind. Instead of there's no way I can change it. I wish I could change it. So at least people know we care. You know, in the real world, sometimes we have to give bad news. And people are so much more likely to accept it 
instead of taking their anger out on us if we deliver it in this more compassionate way. Again, going back to the rock analogy, that the patient is on one side, the doctor is on the other, cold as can be. But if he wants to say something like, here's a support group, you know, I wish I could do more, he moves over to the patient's side and supports him at the most difficult emotional period, literally the most emotional 30 seconds probably is an entire life was that moment. So holy cow, I mean, this Tung Fu, this, this kind of training, I, I think is just so valuable. I believe, and I teach this in my seminars, that we all start each day with a, a, a quiver of stress darts. And throughout the day, we can either hit people with stress darts or we can pull them out. Holding the door open for somebody is what nice about pulling this little stress dart out. That poor guy was just hit with a barrage of stress darts and it didn't have to be that bad. The doctor could have kept a lot of those stress darts <laughs> in his, in his uh, pouch. And because you can't get around the fact that the, the news is bad. I mean, this is one thing I really like about what you're doing. There are no absolutes. There's no saying that every time this is going to turn around, because there are some people that just thrive on being angry and having reasons to complain. And we're not playing psychologists here. But we're we're becoming black belts in communication. See, John, I, I I so I'm so glad you bring up the subtlety of this because someone said, So is Tung Fu just about dealing with difficult people without becoming one ourselves? And I said, it's certainly partly that. However, it's more proactive in that it's giving the respect we all wish that we received and going first and setting a precedent so that people are more likely to respond in kind. And it is this type of proactive communication that sets an example, once again, that's an antidote to some of the challenging, stressful situations we're in right now. I tell my students, the world would be a much better place if people had more respect for each other. And it's going to start with us. So in class, it's always yes, sir, no, ma'am. Military in terms of the communication back and forth, lots of respect. And then uh, they, you know, we endeavor for them to go out into the community and just Mm -hmm. be that step above person that people, yeah. yeah, Again, not throwing those stress darts. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Next scenario. Okay. Let's, uh, a woman came up to me after program and she said, uh, my husband and I are small business owners and we run a flower shop. And she said, can you please talk about this word that causes all these problems? And I'd say, be happy to. And I said, what's the word? And she said, that's the word. I said, no, what's the word that causes the problems? And she said, yes. (laughs) I felt like who's on first? (laughs) This is really exactly that. I don't know who's on second. What's the word that causes the problems? And she said, the word problem. Please put the word problem over on the left. Oh, yeah. And she said, this is a habit. My husband says it automatically without even thinking. It's like at the, um, you know, someone will come up and say, can I talk to you about something? He'll say, sure. What's the problem? At the end of every team meeting, it's like any other problems we need to talk about. Can I make that delivery? Sure. I don't have a problem with that. Hey, I have a problem with the way you handled that customer. She says he is not even aware of it. And yet he says it. People feel like they're a problem child or problem customer. And she said, what can he say instead? And I said, first, understand that for most people, the word problem means something's wrong. wrong. Right? Yep. And when we use that word, we are giving people the impression there's something wrong, even when there's not. Mm -hmm. So I said, all right, when someone comes up and says, can I talk to you about something? Sure. What's on your mind? What would you like to talk about? Just get rid of that word problem, right? At the end of a staff meeting, instead of any other problems we need to talk about, what else do we need to discuss? Anything else we need to address before we wrap up? Instead of saying, I don't have a problem with that, you're welcome to go, (laughs) green green light, go ahead with that. Instead of saying, I have a problem with the way you handled that issue, can we talk about how you handled that issue? Let's strategize to see if there's a more effective way. And and how about if someone gives us a compliment? You know what people say when they say, I really want to thank you for all the time and effort you put in on that. What do we say? No problems. No worries. <laughs> Drives me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> so you, thank you. You're welcome. Happy to. It makes my day when someone takes the time. And and it's really something because when it comes to that word, she said, Sam, we took the words to lose words to use. We put it up in our flower shop. 
And she said, when we would send an email, we would look at it and the butts and the problems were all <laughs> over the place, you know, <laughs> and we just clean it up and it changed the whole tone of the communication. Uh, years ago, I studied again, in addition to your Tung Fu, a trans transformational vocabulary. And uh -huh. they suggested uh, changing problem with challenge. Okay, I, now, that, okay, now tell me how uh, you feel about that, John. How do you feel about that? I think it can be overused because some things are not just challenges. And in, in, instead, in the teaching of the teachers that I do, the teacher of teachers, I instruct them to always move towards the positive and always move towards improvements. So I've got a problem with your kick. No, that's <laughs> not it. You know, if, if you pull your heel up just a little bit more, man, that thing, that'll kill somebody if you hit them with it. That's a, you know, there you go. So we get a, we get away from that because it's, it's that little roadblock. See, I love that you're going deep into this because that is the goal, once again, is to really think about the unintentional impact of the words that we're using. There was a guy at a public workshop and he just looked thunderstruck, John. I mean, I could tell the emotions were just all over his face. And I said, what's going on? And he said, Sam. He said, I have two sons away at college. He said, you know, we go months sometimes without talking. Uh, one of my sons called last night and he said, Dad, can I talk to you about something? He said, guess what I said? Sure, son. What's the problem? Uh, uh, As if the uh, only uh, reason he would call home was because something went. Do you see how we're teaching, aren't we? Where the subtle message to the sun is, if you call, it must be because something is wrong. Is that what we want to teach our kids if that's the only time first they call? Thing, first thing I thought about was chopping the legs out of the kid. I mean, just yeah. just it, 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 would, it, it would discourage him probably from calling again instead of getting onto a regular kind of communication. I can't imagine going months without – I mean, that, that's, that's a real problem. <laughs> So let's let's talk about the, one of the things that I, I like to teach is that there are, people do not have remote controls of your emotion, and they can't push your buttons from that remote. You actually <laughs> push the buttons yourself. And you're taking yes. there's there one stress dart, which could really be, be a real stress dart, you know. But you're then taking them a bunch out of your own package, and you're hitting your body with them. You know, I mean, you're really you're you're taking a stress dart. Do, 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 do. When it happened two hours ago, it happened three hours ago. So part of Tung Fu, I think, and part of respect and maturity is to let things go, get past them and realize that that's their baggage, not yours, particularly in self-defense situations. I know that when I was a young student, had I asked my instructors, if I was going out to the parking lot and there are some guys around my car, they're sitting on my car, what should I do? Their first answer would be, how far away are they? Are they kicking range or are they punching range? You know, tell those imminent first to get off your car. You've got to really search yourself. The reality is as soon as that happens, your body's going to go into fight or flight. It's actually freeze, fight, and flight. So yeah. that's the feeling that you that's going to happen because your body instinctively responds to potential combat by draining blood to the muscles. And that yeah. feels really bad. And the way to overcome that is from a distance, deep rest, deep rest, and then – we have, the, we have the three fight rule. Fight number one is the verbal confrontation. If you can get out of that pool and walk away, you won that fight. It's over with. If you escalate it and you get into a, a, a physical conflict, there's a good chance that you're going to be arrested for assault and battery. And you're going to try and defend the third fight, which is the state prosecutor going after you if something bad happens. And especially if you're a trained fighter. So all that could be avoided, those three fights could be avoided by developing black belt tongue fu. See, uh, you know, uh, uh, let's come back in a moment to the emotions because I really have a wonderful story and technique on how we deal with people making us mad or angry or saying something outrageous that we want to react to. So let's come back to that. Let's respond to your specific story because, as you said, I also wrote a book called Take the Bully by the Horns. And I'll always remember a workshop where there was a, a gentleman who played baseball all through high school, all through college, couldn't wait to get married and have sons. Well, he didn't have sons, <laughs> he had two daughters, you know. <laughs> However, he wanted to introduce them to softball, baseball, you know. And so he took them, he saved his money, didn't have a lot of money, saved his money and took them to a, a baseball game. And he paid for good seats and so forth. 
Well, there were three drunk people behind him. Oh my! And they were they were um, you know using terrible language yes. and sloppy and so forth. And one of them spilled a beer all over his daughter. And he said, everything in me wanted to take on the guy. He said, you know, and and I realized getting a, in a fight in front of my daughters, Ooh. putting them at risk. These guys were drunk. You know, they were not thinking rationally. They would not care if this was an eight year old or a 10 year old girl. Everything that in me that wanted to respond to that thought, no, my first priority is keeping my daughter safe. And he said, so they left. And he said, Sam, I cannot stop thinking about it. I feel like I wimped out. I feel like I was a wuss in front of my daughters. My first reaction was I was keeping him safe. But now I didn't stand up for him. And he said, I can't stop thinking about it. And so let's revisit that situation, right? This is great. Number one, I think it was absolutely wise in the moment to remove yourself from that situation. When you see that these people are not thinking right, that they are going to put your girls at risk, you leave. However, there are options. You don't have to leave the stadium. Go to an usher. Explain what's happening. Either those individuals are removed or they can reseat you some. They have they have a responsibility and they have a customer service accountability to make sure that if you approach them in a reasonable way, they want to keep you as a customer. Right now, what are you modeling for your daughters that you remove yourself from a toxic situation and you are proactive And you still watch the ball game and you do something you love with your girls, right? It can be a win-win. Kung Fu and real self-defense training, what it does, it it expands the spectrum of response. What Kung Fu does and what good self-defense training does is expands the spectrum of responses. And I Mm. know there are households where the child is taught from day one, never show weakness. Somebody messes with you, you bust them upside the head. My dad always said, go pick up a rock Mm -hmm. because he was raised on the streets in Philadelphia back in the forties. I mean, I I, I can't imagine uh, crazy, but the martial arts and and, and when it tongue flu is big part of that expands those uh, responses. And also it gives you pride in avoiding the conflict as opposed to shame in not knocking the guys out. That's what Mm -hmm. he was experiencing when he talked to you. That's at Mm -hmm. least my take on it. That's a great story. Well, and one of the one of the reasons, I mean, Tung Fu now has been published in 17 languages. So it is, you know, it was number three in South Korea. I spoke at the Asian Leadership Conference Whoa. with Jack Ma. And the reason is, is just because of what you said, is that in patriarchal societies, it used to be you never question your seniors. You never, and this is how to speak truth to power with respect. You know, it it gives you a variety of options. So instead of just challenging the senior person and having them go, you know, I'm in charge, you're not. It is to approach them in ways where they choose to do something differently because they want to, not because they're being told to. And they have the power to do that and make that decision. And that, I mean, I I try not to use the word empowering too much, though I have a program called Empower Kickboxing. (laughs) (laughs) But it, but it it really does that. So I know you have more scenarios. I have family, work, and school written down for situations. But let's do a couple more scenarios, and then we'll wrap it up before mm-hmm. maybe okay. make an appointment to do this again. Because I'm sure our listeners will be thrilled with this information. I am. So let's put over on the left. Find fault, right? Let's say something has gone wrong, and everyone's pointing the finger, right? We're in a, a staff meeting, and it's like something, someone dropped the ball, and it's like, I told you to do that. I never got that message. Well, you've been out sick for the last time. You know, Eric, is that when that happens, when people are going at it, and everyone is blaming, shaming, fault finding, et cetera, stop it with this hand gesture. <laughs> no, not that. <laughs> you hold your hand up like a traffic cop would. Now, not not in their face, because yeah. this is not an in their face. And mm-hmm. it's not so meek and weak. It's down here. It's right up about uh, shoulder high face level. This is a universal sign in every culture to just pause for a second. Right. It's not confrontational. It just causes a pause and then say these words. This won't help. You know, we could argue for the next couple of hours about who dropped the ball on this. And it's not going to fix what happened. You know, instead, let's figure out how we're going to prevent this from happening in the future. Or you can say, let's not do this. Calling each other names isn't going to help. You know, instead, let's put a system in place to make sure that we're accountable for this so that we can. And now John F. Kennedy said, our task is not 
to fix the blame for the past. It's to fix the course for the future. That is wonderful. And John, you know, that is that is what we're talking about here. Is we're not being Pollyanna. As you said, yeah. things go wrong. People get angry. There are we, The ball gets dropped. Mistakes are made. And we're not talking about ignoring them. What we're talking about is dwelling on them and blaming and shaming does not help. It hurts. So how can we move the conversation forward and once again, focus on how we can do it right next time instead of, you know, who did it wrong last time? It's being focused on the solution. And that's, that's, that's really, that's big. Okay. Now mm-hmm. what we didn't have in Tung Fu when I first read it was 15 years ago. Did it break? Mm-hmm. Yeah, more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Cyberspace. Mm-hmm. emails, mm-hmm. text, trolls, mm-hmm. dealing mm-hmm. with surprise comments and politics, et cetera. Talk a little bit about how you can integrate Tung Fu into your keyboard. I love what you're saying. And you are right. When I first wrote it, this was pre-internet, John. So, <laughs> However, the, the updated Tung Fu at school and uh, the Never Be Bullied Again books has cyberbullying, has email, has uh, social media, et cetera. So here's one of the best techniques. Over on the left, let's anticipate we're going to get a no, right? We're going to say something, we're going to propose something, and they're going to say no. Over on the right is go. How can we turn no into go? And how? let me give you a 60-second example, and then we'll give the technique. So one of my clients was actually, actually pitching the CTO of the London Olympics. And I said, how much time do you have? And he said, I have an hour. And I said, Mike, you don't have an hour. I said, put yourself in the shoes of your decision maker. What is he thinking? And he said, well, he's probably thinking I don't have time for this. We're 212 days out from the games. I said, guess what the first words out of your mouth are going to be? You may be thinking I don't have time for this. You know, we're 212 days out from the games. So um, and I said, then the next thing you're going to say is, and I have distilled my pitch into 10 minutes. And at the end of 10 minutes, if you would like to continue the conversation, I welcome it. If not, you know, you'll have the, he said, Sam, I can't distill it into 10 minutes. And I said, he said, it's, it's just, it's too complicated. I said, if you don't, he's not listening anyway. Mm. He's resenting you from pulling away from his priorities. He is not going to say yes. So here are the three steps in an email or in person. Ask yourself, what are they thinking? And if they're thinking I'm busy or I've already told you no, or you're asking for money and we don't have any money in our budget, or we tried this before and it didn't work out, guess what the first words are? You may be thinking we tried this before and it didn't work out. You know, I know that you've got a lot on your plate right now. You know, you're right. We did ask you this before. And at that time, you said that it wasn't going to happen. Then the second is and. Because so often we say, but, right? I know you're busy, but, you know, I know what you, but. And then the third step is always take less time than they anticipate. And I'll keep this short, you know, and I've distilled this into one question, you know, and I've distilled the proposal into one page. That is so rare, John. Richard Branson said, time is the new money. I think time is the new trust and online or in person. When we anticipate the objection and address it so that that people aren't just waiting for us to stop talking. And then when we take shorter than they anticipated, they're a lot more likely to read that email or they're a lot more likely to read that one page or listen to our 10 minutes than they would otherwise. I I love that because that is strategically aligning and redirecting. It's part of the plan. It's not I've got to fall back on this strategy. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to align my day, my thoughts, my presentation with their desires. That is outstanding. Anything else you want to finish before we wrap up? Because time is the new money. (laughs) (laughs) He's quick, folks. He's quick. (laughs) Well, see, I love that you got that that showcased the philosophy of Tung Fu, of martial arts, right? Right. Is that this is not just, we don't just do it to get what we want, right? That's one-sided. That's that's destined to f- fail because it's inequitable. It is no, when we put ourselves in the other person's shoes and we think what matters to them, what, what will they respond to, it is an investment in a connection and in preventing a conflict. So do we have time for a 90-second story? Go for it. Okay. So we had talked about the emotions. 
And um, I often close a Tung Fu workshop by putting up Eleanor Roosevelt's quote. And she said, no one can make us feel inferior without our consent. And I change it to no one can make us angry without our consent. And this gruff construction boss stood up and he said, Sam, you're pulling a poly out. He said, you mean someone yells at me that's not supposed to make me angry? And a surgical nurse stood up and she said, I agree with this because I've lived through it. She said, I work with a neurosurgeon who is the most abrasive individual I've ever met. He's a brilliant physician. He has zip people skills. She said, last year, I'm a fraction of a second late handing him an instrument in surgery. He berates me in front of my peers. She said, it took all my professionalism not to walk out of that surgery. On the way home, though, I am thinking about what he said. I am so angry. I get home. I sit down at the dinner table. I tell my husband, I said, oh, I'm so mad. And he said, Judy, what time is it? She said, it's seven o'clock. He said, what time did this happen? She said, nine o'clock this morning. He said, Judy, is it the doctor who's making you mad? And he got up and left the table. And she sat there and she said, I thought about it. And I realized it wasn't the doctor who was making me mad. I was the one who'd given him a ride home in my car. (laughs) I was the one who'd set him a place at my dinner table. And she said, I decided that night that never again was that doctor welcome in my home or my head. And I was no longer going to give him the power to poison my personal life. You know, if the husband didn't say what he did, she would have ended up taking the attorney to bed too that night. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, there would have been three in that bed, John. <laughs> I, I understand this so much from my own experience. I, I wrote a book years ago called The Imposter Syndrome that was uh, about self-help, my, my personal experiences. And I was going through a very uh, rough time with a bunch of people. And I would catch myself throughout the day and lay in bed at night, just going through the conversations that I would have. If that son of a gun was here, I'd just, and it, so I learned to just do this, cancel, cancel, what's next? And it sounds corny, but it really, really works. Cancel, cancel, what's next? I'm not going to, because, well, I'm so mad at him and, or them, and I'm at lunch and I'm just, uh, 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 they're out playing golf and having a good time. So I'm compounding the problem in my life, and it's not having any effect on them at all. So that is a great story. Thank you. It's a great story to wrap with as well. Thank you, John. Certainly give a big platform of potential students. Thank you so much, Sam. It was fantastic. Thanks. That was a fun interview. Sam Horn is one smart lady. I hope you enjoyed it. If so, please leave a comment, subscribe, rate, and review this show. You can also use the microphone at modapodcast.com to record a message that goes straight to me. Thanks for listening and helping me to grow this program.